Christian and the Medieval Academy of America. She served as president of the Medieval Academy of America, of America and on the editorial board of the Chaucer Library. Her monographs include a Latin technical phlebotomy and its Middle English translation, and a hand list of Middle English in Harvard manuscripts. She has pub published 17 articles in scholarly journals and volumes of collected studies that deal with medieval scientific and medical texts. She served as an editor for two academic journals, for the Oxford Dictionary of the Middle Ages, and for a special issue of Early Science and Medicine. She also served as an advisory editor for the British Library online catalog of the Harley Collection. Along with Patricia Deary Kurtz and James Grant, who are both here today, she is responsible for two online databases hosted at UMKC, and by the National Library of Medicine History of Medicine Division. Scientific and medieval writings in Old and Middle English, an electronic reference, and the electronic version of Thorndike and Kimbrey, catalog of incipits of medieval scientific writings in Latin. And having survived the introduction, I present to you Dr. Linda. I and I will try to speak, speak up, up as well. well. So, um, our, our first, first slide uh, is going to be up there for quite a while. Um, the heir of Henry VII, who was expected to succeed him, but he died of the sweating sickness, one of the many major cases in medieval England. I owe many thanks to three British colleagues for sharing their profound knowledge concerning people, places, and events in the epidemic disease discussed in this study. Anne Payne, formerly head of the Department of Manuscripts at the British Library, and the Cambridge scholars Peter Jones and Lee Olson for providing very helpful suggestions on an earlier version of this paper, which I gave to the Welcome Library. Really grateful to the talented medical librarian Marie Thompson at UMKC for invaluable assistance in finding relevant sources. At this date, the global viral pandemic, SARS CoV 2, that resulted in considerable morbidity and mortality in the United States, appears, we hope, to be an unfortunate but diminishing memory, although that disease may still be found in variant forms. In view of this recent pandemic, it's relevant to address the second of the two great English medieval pandemics, the one that was, like sars cov viral and resulted in countless death and enormous political change. It was called Sudor Anglicus, the English sweat. It must, however, be briefly acknowledged that the earlier, better known and extensively studied bacillary plague that was not viral the medieval and early modern outbreaks of Yersinia pestis, or the Black Death, is a disease that survives today, including in the southwest of the United States in a limited way, seven cases a year on average, according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control. It is easily curable if treated promptly with antibiotic drugs. Yersinia pestis, or the bubonic plague, is manifest in three clinical forms, and when treated, with antimicrobial drugs has a 10% mortality. Incidence has decreased during the past six decades with this use of antimicrobial medication. These medicines, however, cannot control infection in the rodent reservoirs, nor have vaccines proven effective. Although antimicrobial drugs given soon after the onset of symptoms of Yersinia pestis prevent many deaths, the necessity remains for prompt diagnoses to enable the immediate therapy that can prevent death. So the focus of this paper is on a plague, but not the Yersinia pestis plague, the extensively studied medieval, early modern, and present-day epidemics of that better-known bacillary bubonic infection. My focus is rather on a plague that is much less common today, for which we should be grateful. The English sweat, Pseudor Anglicus, although the sweat has been docu documented intermittently since the 16th century. It's important to emphasize 
the distinction that the English pandemic called sweating sickness, or frequently in the, in the Latin designation Sudor Anglicus, was not bacillary like Yersinia pestis, but a viral disease recorded in England from the reign of Henry VII, and this is Henry VII's son. This disease recurred widespread at times in England into the 17th century. Although viral diseases have been difficult to document historically or to control, Pseudor Anglicus has nonetheless been the subject of a number of studies. Some of them are contradictory, and many remain inconclusive in regard to both bacillar and viral plagues, Yersinia pestis and the sweat. Extensive scholarship over several decades by Paul Slack on both kinds of pandemics, however, is quite useful. His descriptions and records of mortality of the viral sweat Sutor Anglicus are important. Sweating sickness could be fatal in 24 hours. And documented outbreaks occurred in England in 1485, 1507, 1508, and subsequently in 1517 and 1551. In contrast to the bacillary plague, Yersinia pestis called the Black Death continued to recur long after the catastrophic 14th century appearance in Europe. Viral Pseudor Anglicus, or the English sweat, has been uncommon in England and on the continent since the 17th century, for which we must be grateful, I suppose, although it may have been related to the 18th century Picardy sweat. Unlike bacillary diseases, viral Pseudor Anglicus cannot be identified from ancient burials. So research on the sweating sickness must turn instead to historical records to provide evidence. Especially important here are the European studies by Hyman, Simons, and Coches with Mursada Hukic. Historic records, which may be based, or sorry, which may be biased toward the rich and famous, reveal that the primary victims of the sweat were often wealthy, upper-class adult males, and that the disease could recur in the same patient. While some prominent figures were fatally affected, others, like Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, suffered from the disease repeatedly and recovered from each of several episodes. Advice on therapy recommended by a woman to Cardinal Wolsey, the Chancellor of England and Archbishop of Canterbury, which appears to have been efficacious, is discussed subsequently in this study. So we have here the image of Arthur Tudor, the Prince of Wales, the firstborn son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. A number of years ago, Anne Payne, then head of manuscripts in the British Library, and I undertook a study of a lengthy, mostly English language medical manuscript compiled during the reign of Henry VII, 1485 to 1509. It's now in the possession of Barclay Castle in the west of England. There it's designated SB89, <laughs> this is a really special book, 89. It was purchased at a Sotheby's sale in 1924. This large, early 16th century manuscript was written during the reign of Henry VII for a husband and wife from different but related Yorkshire screw families. Our research was published in a lengthy study, and I will, not, I will spare you the title, both of the study and the journal it occurred in, because they're very long, but can always supply it. In the study of that medical compendium at Barclay Castle, Anne and I recorded references to such terms as sweat and pseudor anglicus in 11 other relevant documents and produced a table, selected witnesses to epidemic disease during the reign of Henry VII. That was a bestseller. <laughs> Some of the documents cited provide information on recovery. This table in our study of the Barclay Castle manuscript makes clear that the terms sickness and great sickness were used without differentiation to refer both to bacillary Yersinia pestis and to viral pseudo A 1990 study by Yuhani Nori on names of sicknesses in English drew a similar conclusion about the ambiguity of documentary records regarding these two diseases. It must be emphasized that the only early evidence for the epidemic disease called the sweat or pseudo-anglicus, which was not bacillary but viral, is by necessity documentary, and even then references to it can be ambiguous. Distinguishing features recorded for victims of the viral English sweat that are consistent can find in a number of historical records that taken together include the following four frequent characteristics. One, the primary victims were young adult males. Two, 
the disease could recur in the same patient. Three, some historical figures like Cardinal Wolsey survived repeated cases. And four, therapy involving isolation and bed rest came to be understood as efficacious. Additional information on the characteristics of Sudor Anglicus can be found in Hyman Coaches and Hukic, The English Wedding Sickness, Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Um, I can give you the full citation if you want. Of the 20 symptoms they associate with sweat, two are cited as severe in cases of the English sweating sickness, their shortness of breath and sweating. An especially revealing contemporary description of Sudor by a non-medical observer in the England of Henry VII, uh, this kid's dad, occurs in the Anglica Historia Polydor Virgil. And I can give you the documentation if you want it. Uh, Virgil's first-hand description of Sudor occurs in a Vatican library and has been printed in some notes in an edition, but it is not found in the 16th century printings of Virgil's book, unfortunately. An influential historical study on the sweat has been John Flood's Safer on the Battlefield than in the City, England and the Sweating Sickness and the Continent in Renaissance Studies. Flood was unfortunately unaware of the English language treatise on the sweat by Thomas Forestier that survives in a British Library manuscript and which I'll discuss briefly later. In addressing the etiology of the sweat, Flood gave equal weight to this disease as a viral fever with high mortality, possibly a hantavirus, or as an RNA virus on the order of the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Subsequent scholarship, such as important studies by Heyman, Coaches, and Hukic, continues the cautious path of identifying this viral disease, whether it was either of these two types, by descriptions of the pathology. Although both Pseudoranglicus the sweat and Yersinia pestis plague were documented in England during the reign of Henry VII, and that was 1485 to 159, and this is his son. These early general references to pestilence or plague often fail to draw a distinction between them. In the later 15th century, vascular and pneumonic illness caused by Yersinia pestis was commonly called plague pestilence, pestilence epidemic, pestilential fever, the infection, and the great sickness. But sub subsequently, we find a number of different names for the new disease, sweat, English sweat, sweating sickness, februm pestilentialum, the hot sickness, and the Latin word for sweat, sudor, or sudor anglicus, the English sweat. Tudor, sudor. Considerably later, from the mid-16th century, such terms as stoop galant and posting sweat are also recorded for this disease. James Carlson and Peter Hammond also addressed this historical disease and described two different views in their study suggesting a link to deer ticks encountered in hunting to explain the high mortality in upper class males. Both the 1485 epidemic and the later 158 epidemic had a significant impact on the royal court. In 2003, Flood pointed out, drawing on scholarship available to him at the time he wrote, that two significantly differing cases can be made for the identification of pseudo-anglicus. Without going into details of the scientific arguments by James Carlson and Peter Hammond, these two argued the case for sweat as re resembling the Crimean Congo viral hemorrhagic fever. And in that study, I also suggested the link to deer ticks acquired in hunting to explain the impact of disease on upper class males. On the other hand, a number of studies from 1998 to the present, some of which also address the later Picardy fever, have taken a different position. That is, that Pseudoranglicus was likely to have been a hantavirus, a disease type which can be transmitted by insect vectors on rodents, or in some cases, as mosquito-borne. Varying studies dealing with causation in chronological order were published from 1998 to 2020, and I will spare you the list of these studies, but I provide them if you wish. Studies that focus on possible hantavirus pathologies are also extensive, and I will spare you those, but we have an extensive body <coughs> arguing either side of the question. A survey of these sources suggests that the weight of argument for the hantavirus explanation may have overtaken the argument for 
a form of hemorrhagic fever, but that matter still has both partisans and remains in dispute, and I stay out of it. In addition to the Polydor Virgil account, the number of the other first English records surviving can, that concern early outbreaks of the sweat in England during the reign of Henry VII uh, are, can be cataloged in Anne Payne's and my Barclay Castle manuscript. The most important historical consideration of early cases of Sudor Anglicus has to address the impact of numerous cases of sweat caused mortality and morbidity close to the English monarch, Henry VII. He ruled 1485 to 1509. Records of English cases survives at least from 1485 when Henry returned to England from exile in France. So there were those, of course, who said, we can blame this on the French. Um, and the sweat appears to have endured as a chronic problem in the west of England and Wales throughout that monarch's reign. Again, that's um, 1485 to 159. The death in April 152 at Ludlow Castle on the Welsh border of Arthur, Prince of Wales, the eldest son of Henry VII and heir to the throne, who you see on the screen, has often been ascribed to the sweating sickness. One, uh, and, as, and he is often referred to as the most famous victim of the sweat, although there are other candidates. Of considerable historic importance is the fact that the death of Prince Arthur meant that his younger brother, Henry, inherited the English throne as Henry VIII. And simply put, the parents of these two boys trained one to be king and let the other one go however he wished. That had consequences. Cunningham and other historians have also observed that concern for contagion of Sudor Anglicus may have been a factor in the decision of Henry VII and his queen not to attend the funeral of their son, Prince Arthur. Records from other communities and regions of late medieval England continue to provide evidence for widespread distress caused by Sudor Anglicus. To consider one example, the successive deaths of two London mayors um, in rapid succession within one week Mayor died, we reappoint another when he dies uh, in 1484 and 1485, as recorded in Fabian's London Chronicle. Less accessible is a book of ours at, surprisingly, Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon, apparently from the Paston family. It suggests a generalized fear of the sweat and contains a Latin prayer invoking the saintly English monarch Henry VI against the sweating sickness. Henry VII had been eager to promote the canonization of his family member and Lancaster and predecessor, Henry VI. M.R. James published two other manuscript versions of this prayer invoking Henry VI for protection against Sudor Anglicus, in addition to that found in the past in Book of Hours. And it was also printed in, book, printed in Books of Hours by Lincoln Word in 1494 and 1505. Important among historical records of sweating sickness during the reign of Henry VII are also the sections of Polydor Virgil's Anglican Historia, not widely known until a recent and better edition appeared. Uh, Virgil's accounts are valuable and important because he is one of the few authors who addressed both epidemic diseases, the Black Death, Yersinia pestis, and the sweat, Pseudor Anglicus, and Virgil drew a distinction between them. He documented the sweat in 1485, one that's relevant here, um, as Sudor Latalis, the deadly sweat, and again in 1503-1506, pestilent Sudor. It's important to emphasize that although Virgil's evidence for the sweating and sickness has been overlooked, his dates correspond to especially high mortality rates, giving the sweat as cause of death at Westminster Abbey, and confirmed in the scholarship of Barbara Harvey. Records also survive of subsequent outbreaks of the sweating sickness in 1508, so now we're going to move on, that began after Henry VII's daughter Mary was betrothed to Charles of Castile, Archduke of Austria, in December 1507. Many deaths from what at that time they began to call Sudor Ille Pernicialis, the pernicious sweat, that pernicious sweat, occurred in London subsequently in the summer of 1508, and the disease seemed to follow the king's progress as he moved from place to place that summer. As opposed to documentation about the sweat, 
the most important early medical treatise on the sweat, in this case secular and professional, is securely linked to the first Tudor king, Henry VII, father of the prince who perished from it. This text is an English version of the work by the Norman physician Thomas Foresti on the venomous fever of pestilence, or Februm pestilentialum. It survives in the British Library additional manuscript. I'm happy to give you the call number if you want it, but it's a long one. It contains, including some in French and Latin, um, text on Pseudoranglicus. Um, Foresti's French version uh, had been, in fact, printed in Rouen in 1490. Um, and there are some good studies on the French, this French text, which I won't list now. The mostly English language manuscript by the French physician Thomas Foresti in the British Library Manuscript Edition 27582 unambiguously addresses the sweating sickness, and it was dedicated to Henry VII. And we'll I think you don't want to hear the Latin nature. The Codex contains both Latin and English for medical recipes and has to be studied along with Foresti's versions in Latin and French and the scholarship of Elmer Brenner. What merits emphasis here, however, are that the English descriptions of the sweat that are found in the Foresti Codex in the British Library that claim to be firsthand. The author identifies himself as of the Faculty of Medicine and of Translating of the Norman Nation, and concludes with a colophon that it was by Thomas Forestier and provides a date, 1485, including the comment that the disease had spread throughout all of England. And I can have it in Latin if you want. The English envoi for this text is addressed to the monarch Henry VII and begins. O noble and meek prince, I beseech thee of thy noble majesty to spare me, though I have thee so bold to write to thy highness of this little governing. For SDA then accurately predicts the lasting relevance of the text. And noble prince, I see that this foresaid sickness in time to come will reign sore amongst us. And indeed it did. This codex, British Library Edition 27582, is on a bond associated with Exeter and it contains other printed manuscript texts in English and Latin. There's a great deal of good, useful study on it by Lister, the late Lister Matheson. And it is important to know that Foresti's French text was printed in 1490 in Rouen, um, and there's a very fine volume of it with an extensive commentary. Matheson's two studies on British Library Manuscript, edition 27582, are essential in establishing the breadth of textual resources available to the compiler of that manuscript. His death was a significant loss to scholarship on Forestier's writing in English, French, and Latin. Further research on companion text to Forestier's treatise in that British Library manuscript remains a desideratum, <coughs> including a deal of study on the provenance. Further research must engage with Fourier's printed French version and utilize the scholarly research on that. Recipes to be used in case of plague and the sweat also occur in later sections of that British Library manuscript following the Forestier text, and they also deserve study. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now we're going to skip to the person who did inherit the throne after poor Prince Arthur died of the sweat, Henry VIII. While both religious texts and professional medical treatises, like those by Foresti, are valuable witnesses to therapy for pseudorangulicus, other kinds of written evidence should not be neglected. In this case, the therapy advocated in September um, 1528 letter to Archbishop and Cardinal Wolsey from Agnes Tilney, second Duchess of Norfolk, is of considerable interest. There's quite a helpful entry on her uh, in the ODNB by Catherine Davies. Agnes, Duchess of Nor Norfolk, born in or before 1477, died 1545. Agnes's advice to the Archbishop, which is similar to that subsequently advocated by Dr. Keyes to be discussed, survives in the English National Archives, the PRO calendared at pages 20, 43, 44, uh, 8 September 1528, and I won't read you the full identification, but I'd be happy to give it to you. Agnes wrote, 
was glad to learn from Wolsey's servant Forrest, whom she met on Lady Day while going in procession to her parish church, that Wolsey was in good health and none of his servants dead, though some had been sick, begs to be informed if he catches a sweat. So she will send Hogan and William Hastings, who will keep it as, as well as possible after the temperate fashion. She has daily experience in her house of all manner of illness, good and bad, and none have miscarried yet, and she uses that term to mean proof fatal. Neighbors send to her when they're ill, and if they be sick at heart, I give them treacle and water imperial, which has saved many who have swooned repeatedly and received the sacraments, and divers to swell at their stomachs, to whom I give set well to eat, the which it driveth away from their stomach. And the best remedy that I do know is to take little or no sustenance or drink until 16 hours be passed advice that was subsequently urged by Dr. John Keyes. Agnes suggests that the Cardinal should not let those who have had the disease come near him for a week after the episode and advises vinegar, wormwood, rose water, and crumbs of brown bread are good to put in a linen cloth to smell into your nose so that the disease <coughs> touch not your visage. Um, rather maybe like the equivalent of the blue masks we wore during COVID you feel like you're doing something that will keep you protected. She hears that my lord of Norfolk has the sweat, and she's a little gleeful about that. They didn't get on very well. And several in his house are dead through the fault of keeping, as she believes. Um, she concludes, my lord, addressing Wolsey, I never saw people so far out of the way in no disease as they be in this, and about 12 or 16 hours is the greatest danger. There be some that sweateth much, and some that sweateth very little, but burneth very sore. But the greatest surety is in any wise to keep your bed 24 hours. I'm grateful to Anne Payne for drawing to my attention this letter to the Chancellor from the Duchess of Norfolk. Writing with confident authority, Agnes advises the Cardinal on treatments that she used in her house, both in terms of ingredients and instructions for administration. She suggests that what the, and I'm not going to name what specific remedy she suggests, uh, but she um, report, reports several remedies known by their common names and the plague recipe of uh, powder imperial. It's significant that Agnes proposes, as did Dr. Keyes subsequently, restricting food and drink from the patient. In the case of advice from the Duchess, fasting should be continued for 16 hours at least. She also comments disapprovingly on the neglect of the disease in the household of her stepson, the third Duke of Norfolk. Agnes Howard describes the course sweating sickness takes, and with confident authority, she places great emphasis on the necessity for avoiding contagion. She avoids the patient take no food or drink at the onset of sweat and keep isolated for a sustained period of time, therapy that is subsequently recommended by Dr. John Keyes who, as you will hear, maintained that confinement in bed was essential for recovery from pseudo-anglicus. Agnes Howard's conclusion to her letter to Archbishop Wolsey, who was Chancellor of England, we remember, is an offer of assistance, taking pride in the precautions in her household, which avoided fatal outcomes of the disease. And here's part of what she wrote to Wolsey. I have the experience daily in my house of all manner of sorts, both good and bad, and thank be God, there is none miscarrying either in my house or within the parish that I am in. For if they that be in danger perceive themselves very sick, they send for such of my house. So she is willing to share her therapy. Cardinal Wolsey, the recipient of this letter from Agnes Howard, is often cited as an example of a patient who suffered from recurrent bouts of pseudo anglicus. It, you can find them listed in the ODNB entry. In, uh, on Wolsey and Sybil Jack, uh, listing a number of times the Archbishop suffered from pseudo anglicus. What is important in the history of the treatment of pseudo anglicus is that the therapy Agnes Tilde advocated for Wolsey continued to be used in England and was lauded for its efficacy. It was also employed on the continent where it became known as the English Cure. The English Cure, as advocated by Agnes, that is, the necessity for restricting food and drink along with bed rest and isolation is important because this therapy spread and was adopted by the medical profession. So, skip ahead now. 
as discussed by Flood and Slack, uh, versions of this English cure, mandating bed rest and isolation, and we'll hear more about it later, became famous in England and also on the continent as an efficacious treatment for Sudor Anglicus. <clears throat> Most important is the fact that the therapy Agnes advocated for the Archbishop was described and expanded in the influential professional English text on the cure by the London and Cambridge physician John Keyes. And I need to explain his name. Um, he was born with a name that was spelled either K-E-Y-S or K-W-E-S, Keyes. But he went to Cambridge where uh, it was a totally Latinate culture and there are no K's in Latin. So, they, so he had a problem with his name and changed the spelling of it to C-A-I-U-S, which mean, which allows keys to work in Latin and enabled him to get along in Cambridge and in a Latinate world. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and this is Gonville and Keys College, uh, which was named after Dr. Keys. Uh, and this is a early um, print which probably does reflect what it was like when he was there as a student. John Key's treatise was published on, in London on 1552 as a book or counsel against the disease commonly called the sweater sweating sickness. Keyes also wrote a longer, more technical treatise in Latin for doctors, his professional audience, and I spare you the title. Both Key's Latin and English treatises are important records of this physician's method methods of diagnosis and therapy, and both texts can be found in the mammoth volume that reproduces in facsimile the work of John Keyes. And it's endorsed over. <laughs> but it does exist. If you want to read everything by John Keyes, it's all there. Um, John Keyes was born in Norwich to a family, as I've already said, spelled K-E-Y-S, but uh, when he entered Gonville Hall, Cambridge in 1529, he had to change the spelling of his name to Latinized orthography. The faculty there included physicians, and he studied medicine there, and was elected a fellow at the hall in 1533. But in 1539, he moved to Italy, to the University of Padua, where Vesalius taught anatomy from 1537. They only overlapped for two years. In Padua, Keyes undertook the study of Galenic treatises in order to correct errors that appeared in the transformation of those texts he edited. Following uh, three years of research and study in Italy, Keyes moved to Basel, that very important Swiss center in book production, known for printing vast numbers of Reformation texts as well as the early printing of Copernicus. By 1542, Keyes had published in Basel the results of his Padua study in uh, expanded editions of seven texts by Galen. Uh, there, the influence of Erasmus, who had died in Basel in 1536 and was buried there, must have been important to Keyes, who subsequently added to the epistle for his 1556 volume on the sweat the comment that he had at age 20 translated for his friends some of the Latin works of Erasmus. Again, the published works of John Keyes can be found in that big book. Okay, the connection between John Keyes and Henry VIII. Uh, we've already seen, okay. After his residence in Basel, Keyes returned to Cambridge, but he moved to London in 1545 and in 1546 at the urging of Henry VIII, undertook the demonstration of the salient anatomy for the London barber surgeons, a role he continued to serve for many years. 1547, the year of the death of Henry VIII, Keyes was elected a fellow of the London College of Physicians and served several terms as president of that college. He was highly respected for his expertise on Galenic texts. Okay, so let's, we've got the Gonville Hall. John Keyes subsequently returned to Cambridge, to Gonville Hall, and was in 1559 elected master there where he oversaw the construction of new buildings. In Cambridge, he was, however, viewed as autocratic and was opposed in the college by those of less conservative religious views who accused him of popery. We probably recall that Cambridge was a locus of Reformation writings. Perhaps as a result of these difficulties with confessional matters, Keyes returned, Keyes returned to London and lived there until his death in 1573, 
in his house near St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Keyes remained loyal to Gonville Call, however, and left all his possessions to the college, which was later renamed Gonville and Keyes College. So, let me summarize the influence of John Keyes, MD. It may be argued from our much later perspective that John Key's greatest long-term influence consists past tense, sorry, of his treatises in English and Latin on the sweating sickness. Best known is his English volume that circulated in England as a book or counsel, or counsel against the disease commonly called the sweat or sweating sickness. It was published in London in 1552 and dedicated to the Earl of Pembroke William. The text continued to be read for the therapy for the sweat that he specified as efficacious. The treatise is some 35 pages in length and contains much practical advice, but perhaps surprisingly little medical theory. It cannot be described as an academic text, which is in fact more frequently read and consulted than was his long 1515 academic treatise on the Pseudoranglicus. And I will spare you the Latin title, it's some 55 pages. An image of Dr. Keyes appears on the title page of the English language volume and will be reproduced here subsequently. But let's look at the title page, the slide four, slide five. There we go. That's his text, uh, and that's his title page. Uh, a book or counsel against a disease commonly called the sweat or sweating sickness. Uh, and then it goes on to give the, some of the printing information and has been reprinted in 1912 in that very big book. Key's recommendations for therapy for pseudoranglicus, whether in English or Latin, became known as the English cure. Uh, his text itself has quite a lengthy title, a book or counsel against a disease commonly called the sweat or sweating sickness made by John Keyes. You can read that yourself probably. Doctor and physic, very necessary for every person, and much requisite to be had in the hands of all sorts for the better instructions, preparations, and defense against the sudden coming and fearful assaulting of the same disease. And um, this text begins with an epistle to William the Earl of Pembroke, who apparently had helped underwrite the printing, from what we can tell. And um, <clears throat> He, he indicates in his prologue that friends have asked him for a little counsel how to govern themselves. He's written books in English and Latin, but he dedicates this English language treatise to the Earl in London on the 1st of April, 1552, the book of John Keyes against the sweating sickness. He cites his readings and writings in Greek and Latin and explains that he now writes in English best to be understand and most needful. He does not want to write in Latin and have his text translated by others after their misunderstandings. Okay, another slide. Okay. Uh, Keyes uh, actually had himself depicted uh, with this later printings of this book. In the book, he accurately recounts the hundred year history of the sweat in England from 1485, and he uses the Greek word ephemera that is to say, one day, a favor of one day, fever of one day. He recounts occurrences accurately in England in 1506, 1517, 1528, and again in 1551. He points out that although it's called the sweat, it is more accurately described as a fever, characterized by vomit, bleeding, and diarrhea. It is an entirely different disease than is the plague or the pestilence. Because it lasts 24 hours, it should be called ephemera, the term for a disease lasting a single day that was used by Galen. Keyes goes on to identify causes of the disease. Infection and impure spirits in bodies <coughs> corrupt by repletion. Other factors may be constellations and evil mists, carrion, drowned locusts, rotting corpses after battle and bad air. Secondary courses are evil diet, too much meat, and he repeatedly uh, seems to be uh, opposed to carnivores, um, and I think we'll get back to that again. The disease haunted us English men more than other nations. He will show, and Galen confirms, that our bodies suffer more disease than other nations, except there be in them a certain matter prepared like to receive it. Therefore, ephemera is often in England, but it never enters Scotland, which is historically documentable. Even though England and Scotland are joined, similarly it is in Brabant, but not Germany. He suggests that the cause 
must be the evil diets of the countries where it occurs as they eat more meat. Keyes throughout his writing suggests the relationship between a carnivorous diet and the sweat. He also advises the reader not to avoid England. Fleeing to other countries is useless. One can't say patients who have so much sweating stuff, so many evil humors laid up in store. In Calais, Antwerp, and other places in Brabant, only the English got sick there. Contributing factors for keys include diet, complexion, age, time of year, open pores, and evil ear, air from exhalations out of infected earth. I don't know quite what that means. The sweat is more likely to affect men of wealth, ease, and welfare or the poorer sort, such as were idle persons, good ale drinkers, and tavern hunters. Health begins with preservation, taking heed of diet and air. Avoid the English excessive diet. Eat modestly and temperately. Avoid wine in the time of sweat. The old manly hardiness, stout courage, and painfulness of England is utterly driven away by the disease. Men become womanly and children, if they be not all day by the fire with toast and butter, in their furs they be straight sick. Take away dung hills and purge the air with bonfires. Um, he emphasizes that cleanliness is a great help to health, and he advises keeping clothes sweet smelling and clean. Various prophylactics are recommended, including such drinks as Mithridatum or Venestrigal. KP's preventative advice suggests that one should go outdoors only with a handkerchief soaked in vinegar and rose water, which makes me think of the blue masks that we all were wearing for a while. Uh, advise that perhaps reminds us of our blue COVID masks. And he provides a list of preservatives easy to purchase that may be taken. He advises against fasting, but one should not stuff bellies full. One should consult his Latin book on how to evacuate evil matter from the body. In fact, subsequently he goes on in some detail uh, in English to explain how to assist a patient's evacuation in a warm bed. Other advice includes finding a learned man in physic. This book is not sufficient. Get a good physician. Exercise is good, quick and lively for men. He suggests all sports for men and bowling as a good exercise for women. But exercise should be avoided when the sweat is present. Do not be idle. All need to live for some purpose or service. Here is avoidance of shameful diseases, hateful vices that punish the immortal soul. Apparently venereal diseases, although his terminology is vague. He is certainly not prudish when he recommends coitus, describing it as honest company between man and woman as a part of natural exercise and a help to emptying, lightening the body and other times allowed in the sweating time for health's sake. He repeats several times the importance of not favoring the idle. One should have compassion on those forced by necessity, but not on those whose fault created the necessity and goes on to say, we need wealthy children to support needy and impotent parents. <laughs> Keyes further addresses what he calls curation in specific detail. His therapy requires that the patient lie in bed clothed with additional covers without food or drink for 24 hours. He recommends methods to increase sweating, which include rubbing, warm drinks, layering on and clothes, and heating the patient for 12 or 14 hours with fire in the chamber. He recommends that the patient drink a very hot guaiacum, which is derived from a tropical plant, and avoid sleep. If necessary, make the patient fast, dietary fasting, and sweat as much as 12 times. The patient must relieve himself, defecate in warm sheets, and then the patient must be cleaned without allowing contact with air. It's not clear how that's accomplished. If the body by sufficient sweat has discharged the venom, the person is safe. Keyes concludes that if the patient fails to sweat enough, you must make him sweat as many times as necessary, even 12 times. Fasting is necessary for 24 hours. Within 24 hours, move the patient from one bed to another. After 24 hours, dress the patients, let them eat appropriate food, and they can have wine. The patient should not leave house for two or three days after what Keyes calls the fit. Okay. <coughs> um, so here we have a portrait of John Keyes at age 43. You previously saw the title page of Colophon of the 1552 front of his book. And Keyes concludes, thus have I declared, of this disease, the sweating sickness, English ephemera or pestilent sweat, for the common safety of my good countrymen against the sudden assaults of the disease, 
and to satisfy the honest request of my loving friends and general acquaintance. And then the qualifier. If other causes there be supernatural, them I leave to the divines to search and the diseases thereof to cure, as a matter without the compass of my faculty. There we have the call. Okay. That's John Keyes and the Sweating Sickness. So, are there comments, thoughts, responses? There seems to be one in the back. <laughs> oh, maybe not, perhaps not. Did it just stop? Who has the question? Uh, the question is, did it just stop? Yeah, did they not see it anymore, or did um, they get a handle on it? Or? I, it did stop, but I do not think there is an assumption that it stopped because of Key's cure. Um, although it is possible if Key's cure reduced the mortality, there was less exposure we could, uh, to the disease. Um, if he's confining people to bed, they're not out spreading it around, but uh, it, it did fade away. Yeah. And so far as I've been able to ascertain, there aren't clear documented records of it subsequently, unless possibly there are people who say there was something later called the Picardy sweat in Picardy for obvious reasons that might have been the same. But, I guess we must be grateful it doesn't exist anymore. Because I was thinking if it were hand side, it would have cropped up in other places. And, yeah. There would be more text in other languages. Yeah. Right? Uh, there, I mean, there is a French text, because Forestier's manuscript in the British language is partially French, and then um, his full French text um, was printed in around 1490. So there was a French text. but. Um, we really don't. Keyes wants to emphasize that it's for primarily an English disease, but why is there a French text if that's the case? This disease was prevalent. Not out. clear on the epidemiology. How prevalent is this disease? How many people per year or some database? How prevalent? Uh, the, well, oh. <laughs> there's not. Um, the, it, almost everything about this disease is a retrospective study. Um, so far as we know, unless it's a, some kind of hantavirus or it doesn't exist now. Um, so we have to depend on people like he's describing the symptoms and then there are attempts to fit that with what we know of, of, of their viral disease. It would be interesting to compare the prevalence of years ago with the prevalence today with our modern diets, because it was striking the information that from one of the doctors, I believe, who said, who was concerned about people eating too much meat and so on and so forth. Right, Keyes, Keyes is, uh, I don't know that he's a strict vegetarian, but he really does seem to link excessive meeting, eating of meat with the disease and whether in fact that. I guess what concerns me, what would concern me, I'm a toxicologist, uh, would be the vector itself. What specific thing right. is coming into the body that's causing the problem? And I know that it's extremely difficult to, to trace, but uh, the difference in diet seems fairly important and the relative prevalence. The other thing I was struck by was um, is there a possibility this is a genetic related disease? For example, sickle cell uh, amenia, amenia, amenia is, a, is a problem which relates to a certain race. Is this thing perhaps genetically related? I mean, traced to all the relatives down the line historically, that kind of thing? That's, or is a question we ought to Yeah, we I, I can only say what he said. That's beyond my expertise. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think we're very lucky that we have what Keyes wrote, uh, but the degree to which it maps with modern disease analysis and therapy um, is beyond my can, I don't know. Linda. Yes. Hantaviruses, at least a lot of strains, are dependent on uh, rodents 
for their proliferation and transmission. And the fact that at the moment a number of uh, rodent populations that were probably much more prevalent then than in the later centuries, especially now, could be the reason that in fact the vector died out and thus the virus does not no longer manifest itself. It, uh, we don't, it's, it's, yes, it's very hard to know what was going on with rodents at the same time when we have a hard time finding out what was going on with people. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's, uh, I have come to, Okay. I've come to the conclusion that I've come to the conclusion that these documents can be really interesting and reveal what was going on at that time, but I don't know how much more we can make of them other than understanding the past, understanding what they were up against and how they tried to cope with it. I don't know. It would be great if we could find that. Oh, in fact, everything he advocates is in fact therapeutic, but. Peter. Beyond my can. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hey. Just go ahead. There's no mic. Oh, um, I have I have a question. I haven't heard you that uh, mention that any women have been affected by this disease, or or have you found anything about? about the effect of this disease on women in, in your research? Or do women not exist in, in, no. the, in your sources? <laughs> That's a good question know. because he usually talks about male patients, but he also talks about female patients. Um, and particularly, you know, he wants, he wants the, them both to get out and exercise. And so he wants uh, and then to, to take up bowling um, and he, so on. So um, it's not uh, pervasive throughout his writing, but you do get these mentions. Uh, the earlier writers that I've mentioned tend to focus only on male uh, patients, and that may be not because they didn't, there weren't females who had it, but because there is evidence that males have been out hunting, therefore maybe hunting causes it. It's not necessarily that it may be at home too. I don't know. It's a very important question and I don't know how to take it any further. But I'm okay. glad you were Thank you. Yes, Linda, please. Pete? Yeah. Uh, it seems that this, uh, this disease, the Sudora anglicus, was not uh, spread out in Italy or France. Uh, any reason? Just it was just uh, that's a, that's an ongoing question. Why why was it found? Uh, well, there there are a number of people who believe that it may have been brought from France when Henry the Seventh brought French troops uh, to reclaim the throne from the Yorkists, and they came around the south of England and came in from the west. Uh, and there were French troops who supported him in the, um, the famous Battle of Bosworth Hill, which he, in which he defeated Richard of York. So that's the only, I think, kind of uh, connection that, uh, that can be obviously drawn about something from France to England is whether it could have come with his army because it seemed to have begun very shortly uh, after the Tudor victory. And he wasn't a, t these monarchs really weren't Tudors, they took the name arbitrarily because it was politically desirable. Bibi, you had a question. Yeah, it's a slightly personal twist on it, and you have touched uh, about it, but what made you so interested in this topic? Well, uh, as I mentioned, Ann Payne and I tackled a huge medical manuscript in Barclay Castle and spent too much of our life studying our lives. And it keeps coming back to recipes for um, 
instance, a lot of recipes for um, scattered throughout. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, one thing leads to another in scholarship, as everybody knows. Um, there is um, a lot of literature, but I don't think there's any QED literature out there that says, this is what happened, this is what we know for absolute certainty. We don't know. Thank you, Linda.